Hey everyone. Whoa! Very loud. Is there a volume on here? Oh, my mic is not on. This is not bad. I'm very, very, very loud. Is there any way I can turn this down? You know what they say, know, know yourself. I'm gonna just hold it out here. How about this? Good? Uh, everyone have a great lunch, barbecue, fried chicken, I don't know. The lines are brutal. Anyhow, people on the uh, live cast probably don't want to hear about that. Hi, I'm Dave Aronchek. I'm a uh, product manager at Google. I, uh, until recently, was a product manager on the Kubernetes project, and now we're working on something brand new, which we're really excited about. Uh, this is Vish. Vish, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Vish. I'm a Kubernetes maintainer, and uh, I work at Google on GKE and Kubernetes. Uh, basically, I've been focusing mostly on the mic is hot. How about now? I guess you have near me. Hey, everyone. I'm Vish. Uh, I work at Google. Uh, I work on Kubernetes. I've been working with Kubernetes for the last three to four years. Uh, more recently, I've been focusing on like enabling high-performance applications, and specifically uh, machine learning with Kubernetes in a portable fashion. And, and also like looking at more of the application stack and making empowering Kubernetes users, essentially. Yep. So um, like I said, we are here to talk about something brand new, uh, specifically Kubernetes and machine learning, which we think is one of the best opportunities to really uh, extend and use the functionality that Kubernetes provides under the hood. And so whenever you approach something new, you always want to start uh, with a question. What is machine learning? We're not going to do one of these like look up in the dictionary things, the definition of machine learning. Nope. So the idea is first you start with a question. And in this case, I don't know how many people have bought a house recently or sold a house or something like that, but you may say, well, how do you determine what your house is worth? Uh, you come up with some metrics, in this case, square footage and uh, uh, overall house price. And you start drawing some points on a graph. And you start and you say, okay, well, here's a point on the graph. Maybe I'll add some more. Maybe I'll add a lot more. And then all of a sudden, it looks like a pattern. And you're like, this is magic. Uh, then you answer your question. How much did you sell your house for? Well, my house is this big. Uh, therefore, I go up to the chart. I go over. And I get a number. Presto. Machine learning, right? Except, uh, congrats, you're a machine learning expert. And on the way out the door, you can't get a certificate with uh, certifying that. But uh, things can get complicated, right? Uh, you could have nonlinear groupings based on neighborhoods and environment and crime rate and so on and so forth. Uh, things could be multidimensional. Here, obviously, I had something incredibly boring, just two uh, features in a linear regression. Uh, or things could change over time. Uh, and so at a, as a, uh, at a high level, what we think machine learning is is when uh, it's you, a way to solve problems without explicitly knowing how to create the solution. Okay. Uh, do we believe at Google this is like our biggest passion in the world? Uh, I don't know if you know, we have some large data centers and they're pretty uh, expensive to run. Uh, the number one price ends up being power most of the time. And we have some pretty smart data center engineers and we said, Hey, data center engineers, do you think you could wire up ML to you know, the way that we run our data centers and improve things? So they did. And uh, for those that don't know, the, the uh, benchmark for, ML, uh, excuse me, for data centers is PUE, which stands for Power Usage Effectiveness. You ideally want it to be one. One watt goes in, one goodness comes out. Uh, nobody ever runs at one. So at Google, it looks like this. This is how our uh, ML, or excuse me, our data center efficient power usage efficiency was working. We literally hooked up the data center to this ML thing that ran the water and fans and so on and so forth, and it looks like this. And then we turned it off, and it looked like that. It literally was like flipping a switch. And that's the power of machine learning. And because of that, we think machine learning should be for everyone. That would be a great thing, except, ML needs DevOps. And by that, what we mean is DevOps needs composability, portability, and scalability. And I'll get to these in just a second. Is there any way we could turn this down just a little bit? Even holding it away from my face, it's uh, do you, feedback. If you could switch microphones. That's fine. So by DevOps, like I said, by composability, I mean the following. Uh, a lot of people look at 
ML and they say, well, great, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to download PyTorch or TensorFlow or CNTK or something like that, and I'm going to go build a model. Who thinks they are done when you've finished building your model? No hands go up. Good. You're all very smart. The reality is that real ML looks a lot more like this. You got a whole bunch of steps and each of those steps are individual decisions and services and so on that you need in order to get an answer. That's what we mean by composability, being able to pick and choose those various items. The second is a quote by uh, Joe Beta of uh, literally a few weeks ago. Uh, Every time you move from one environment to another, you need portability. You need a system that understands how to move with uh, making as few changes as possible. Because every time you have a change, as he says here, that's a likelihood of an outage. So we go back to this path over here, and you look at all those services, and each one of these may be on a different system. And every one of those systems has an opportunity for change, conflict, something going wrong. Uh, in particular, uh, in the ML space, you see here, like you'll have containers, those containers on premises may run against CPUs, but then when they move to the cloud, they use GC, uh, GPUs of various size. They could be uh, ASICs or FPGAs or you name it. Um, even ML frameworks often operate differently in different environments, and you need that stability as well. And then finally, scalability. Uh, I think you're going the opposite direction on the volume. Is there any, like I'm, I'm now like about two feet from my face. Down here. Okay. So as far as scalability is concerned, same deal. You, you often want to be highly scalable. So you, you start your um, ML and uh, one minute later you realize you're not going to um, you know, converge for the next 450 years. Maybe you'd like to add some more machines. That's a perfect opportunity for scalability. So what's really good at uh, composability, portability, and scalability? Bish. Well, the answer should be clear. It's Kubernetes, right? Like, it's already doing all of this, and we just like we're just going to talk about like how it helps with machine learning specifically here. Um, so here's like a really high-level picture, right? Like, I want to give this message across, and it may be obvious to some of you, but I just want to like drill on it a little bit more because I want people to think of Kubernetes this way. In that, like, Kubernetes is abstracting out a whole lot of things, right? It's abstracting out your 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 cloud whether it's like a public cloud or a private cloud, you don't have to worry about that because there are people worrying about it. And so you have like separation of responsibilities there. And then you have a variety of hardware resources that, that, that you might want to consume. You may not want to consume all, you may want to consume some, but you may want to like extend it to consume something else. Um, so Kubernetes abstracts all of that. And then you have a whole bunch of like operating systems and like kernels and versions and so on. It's like, that's another whole beast and like host demon. Um, and like, Kubernetes provides you primitives where uh, you can have separate teams managing that, and still, like, Kubernetes continues to work for you, and, and it, like, shields your end users, in this case, like, uh, data scientists or, uh, say, your ML practitioners from all those churn that's going on, right? Like, they don't want to know all of that. Why should they know that? Um, and then, like, you have the core Kubernetes itself, which I'm not going to get into in this talk, uh, but hopefully, like, people have some idea of what Kubernetes is. And in addition to that, you also get a whole bunch of other primitives that are very important for managing infrastructure at scale. Like, you get primitives like uh, authentication and, and, and authorization with RBAC. You get, like, built-in monitoring that's extensible to almost all of your applications. You get, like, built-in logging, coda, namespaces. So these are, like, a common set of functionalities that you can apply for a whole bunch of workloads, right? So now, given that, like, you've gotten to this level where you have this common infrastructure that you can deploy on, now what are you going to do? Like, the more interesting part is, like, running the real applications, right? Like, that's, that's the reason why all this infrastructure even exists. So you can go and like choose your application. You're not like restricting you to some specific set of applications. You can go choose your own like distributed storage. You can go choose your own database or your blob store. You can go choose your own like uh, uh, I don't know a MapReduce solution, or you can go choose your own like ML training operator, or you can you can choose your your, your serving service. Uh, Kubernetes doesn't restrict you, but the good part is it's pretty easy because like all the rest of the problems are solved. So you can have like individual groups of people focusing on just that, and they don't have to worry about the rest of the infrastructure. That's pretty cool, right? Like you have you have a large organization, and now you know how they can all like cooperate with each other and still add value to to the rest of the the direct end consumers. So in this case, the end consumers are, are most likely going to be data scientists, and they are going to focus on their workflows, which is like say Jupyter 
or it's like TensorFlow or Cafe or whatever it is, they only think about that. They don't think about the rest of the infrastructure, right? And, and that's sort of the Google model, and like, that's totally possible with Kubernetes, and we are starting the journey now. Um, and so, like, specifically, uh, Kubernetes already supports accelerators um, in, a, in an extensible manner, in that like, you don't have to wait for upstream to support everything. GPUs are already supported, and like, there's more and more uh, enhancements happening along that in, in 2018, where we'll be having like, performance optimizations and all of that, that funness. Um, and there's also going to be support for FPGAs and like, high performance NICs and so on. So the upstream is like, enabling all sorts of extensions that unblocks you from doing what are awesome things you want to do. Um, and in addition to that, there are like a lot of uh, application deployment primitives already in there. Um, there's like jobs and there's like stateful sets, which lets you like describe some of your common machine learning workflows. And so you don't have to like go and rebuild all of this. You can just like you can become productive in a day or two with a, with a, with a pre-existing Kubernetes cluster, rather than like going and buying a machine from like uh, from from a store nearby and like starting to install drivers and all. Then spending like a month. And then now you're starting to go do the cool things, right? Like you don't have to do that. Like there's already a solved problem, um, and it scales to like thousands of nodes. So if you if you get to the point where you're going to run many experiments at the same time, then you can actually do it with Kubernetes. And and if you are running in a public cloud, for example, you you don't have to provision for your peak utilization. Like you just go use your single machine, and when you're ready to like go and launch, say a thousand experiments, the resource is there for you, and Kubernetes still works. You don't have to shift to a different platform. And container packaging is already a standard, right? Like you don't, again, you don't have to reinvent the wheels there. So all these things are common problem for machine learning as well, and Kubernetes would solve that for you. And there's actually more, right? Like I, I hinted a little bit on like auto scaling. So auto scaling is like working in, in, in like most uh, Kubernetes managed services today. Uh, we have support for like priority and eviction. Where like say if you have an intern and you, it's intern hiring season and you you have like hundred interns in your company, each one is like doing an ML experiment, but you have the shared resource. And you have a researcher who's having a conference deadline, and they have to get their get their training and like get their models built. Are you going to have the interns come and like ruin their conference? No, right? Like, do you, are you going to create a separate system for that? Why? Kubernetes provides all those primitives for you already, where you can set priorities for individual users, and 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 make sure that like uh, a, a low priority user does not go ahead and like take away all the other resources that are that are meant to be consumed by more important people or more important uh, things that are happening within your, your, your organization. Um, we also, I'm, going to, I'm just going to state this, but if you have more questions about this, I'll talk, I'll, I'll be, I can, I'm happy to like, explain further after the talk. Kubernetes is assuming adequate network bandwidth. So this is sort of a fundamental uh, distributed system design assumption that, that Google has evolved to over time. Um, so like, our general recommendation is like, over oh, your network, don't try to solve like, locality issues too much. So that's the kind of model like upstream is moving and moving towards, and it's, it's already in that direction. But we still support data gravity for scenarios where you don't, you just cannot like build over provision networks. Um, and we also provide like a whole bunch of primitives like labels and and software drivers and like device plugins and so on, which lets you like manage the life cycle of the hardware itself and and the software that goes on to power that hardware. Like for example, the NVIDIA drivers, you can manage all of that using Kubernetes, right? So it's like there's, because there's like one common API on top of which you can layer everything, and so management becomes much simpler, and you don't have to learn new systems or manage new systems to do the same boring job. Right? So that's the main message here, but right, you, you want to use machine learning on Kubernetes. I talked about all the, the awesome infrastructure stuff that like, Kubernetes can provide. But like I said earlier, data scientists or ML practitioners, they don't want to see that infrastructure, right? Like, they don't want to learn the Kubernetes APIs. Like, that's, that's, not, like, that's not their specialization, right? Like, that's not the thing that's most fun for them. So are you going to, like, tell them, hey, go learn Kubernetes, go learn Docker, go learn containers, and then, like, now, now we can start doing whatever you want to do? Um, like, look at the sheer number of things that you have to learn in order to start becoming effective in using Kubernetes for machine learning. It's like, I mean, it's, it's a fire hose, right? Like, you probably have to do like 10 Coursera courses before you can like even get to the point of like doing some, some, some interesting machine learning in production. You don't want people to do that, right? So, wait, what do you do now? Uh, so, with that, we are proud to announce uh, Kubeflow. Uh, we are not talking about this incredibly broadly, just you here and those on the stream. We're gonna be talking a lot about it a lot more uh, shortly. 
But the summary is we want to make it easy for everyone to learn, deploy, and manage portable distributed ML on Kubernetes everywhere. Uh, just like Kubernetes, we very, very strongly believe that this should work uh, everywhere in the world, not you know, on-premises, on your laptop, on your cloud provi provider of choice. So, um, you know, we, we're, uh, we don't have a ton of time, but the, the idea is we very, very much embrace the philosophy that we had said earlier uh, around composability, portability, and scalability. Uh, Kubernetes and Kubeflow should provide this out of the box. Uh, speaking of the box, uh, inside the box, uh, at the start, and we are just getting started here, we give you a Jupyter Hub. Uh, thank you very much to the folks at Jupyter. I saw a UV back there. Um, a TensorFlow training controller, which auto scales, depend, or not, it doesn't auto scale, it deploy, uh, scales uh, based on what you have available to it. So if you have CPU or GPU or multi GPU, you can configure it very easily. Uh, TensorFlow serving deployment and the wiring and service endpoints between them to make it very easy to get going out of the box. Uh, and what's in the box, you saw this earlier, uh, it is just these steps in it. Uh, over time, we would love to expand it, we'd love to make it each step deeper, uh, offer a lot more options, but that's up to the community and the people who want to take it there. Uh, using Kubeflow will ideally look like this. You do Kube control, uh, Kube control, and that's how you pronounce it. Kube control apply uh, components, and it will create it on your laptop. You do the exact same command on your mini cluster. You do the exact same command on your uh, 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 larger cluster, and it will work. Um, and uh, we'll skip over just to get to the uh, demo. The interesting part, yes. I guess. Yes. Uh, I'm going to have a hard time saying cube control, so <laughs> just better than that. <laughs> well, you could say it wrong. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> uh, all right. So I'm going to try to do a live demo. I'm not sure how this is exactly going to turn out, but let's see. Um, hopefully, the demo got to the Um So what I have here is a mini cube cluster, so you can I'll make sure that it's obvious that it's a mini cube cluster. I'm going to what I'm going to I already have the Kubeflow repository cloned, um, so I mean I, I could probably like show the Kubeflow repository for you, um, just to just to give you an idea of like what we mean by Kubeflow. Here we go. Um, so this is a repository. I have cloned this. Um, I'm at the base directory. What I'm going to do is like I'm going to apply um, all the components in there. Um, okay, I need to change. There we go. So I just went ahead and like deployed Kubeflow. Um, the next step is like I'm going to show what pods exist in here. Um, so what we have here is like uh, we have a TensorFlow service, and then uh, we have Jupyter Hub, and then we have a TensorFlow <laughs> operator. Uh, I'm going to go and like try to show how we are going to use each of these things uh, in just a bit, but I just want to show this is what is in the box uh, as part of Kubeflow as of now. Right? The next step is like um, I'm going to open up open up Jupyter Hub. Oh God, this echo is like. Um, so uh, let me also like list the services that are here, um, and then so I'm going to use a mini cube command for opening up service, which is mini cube service and then pointed at a load balancer. And so here we go. I, uh, I'm, I'm opening up, well, I mean, Google has these awesome proxies that get in the way of demos. Um, let me turn off those proxies and then uh, that should work now. So here we go. So you have Jupyter Hub just working out of box for you, right? Like, and by default, we have like a dummy authentication system, which you can like replace with your own organization's favorite authentication system, be it like Google Auth or, or GitHub and so on. Um, so let's say I'm just going to log in. Um, I'm going to start my server. Um, I'm going to, we have two options now with TensorFlow. You have a CPU and a GPU image. Uh, since this is Minikube, I don't really have that much of resource on my teeny tiny Mac. So I'm going to like stick to the minimum amount of resources I need for this demo. I don't need GPUs, so I'm just going to go ahead and like launch. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and like launch my notebook. So you have a notebook here which has a few pre-built models that's part of like a TensorFlow garden. Um, and it's just there to like show that you can get going pretty easily and that like you have all the tooling you need in order to, in order to like start, uh, start working with TensorFlow, right? And to demonstrate this, what I'm gonna do is like, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to run a benchmark. There's a specific reason why I'm choosing a benchmark for this demo. Uh, it's because if I were to like go ahead and like try to train a real model like Inception or ResNet, it's going to take quite a while and it's probably very boring for you. <laughs> so what I'm going to do instead is like choose a benchmark that shows some like really nice numbers, and also like show the fact that you can iterate locally on your laptop, and when you move to the cloud, you get this like infinite bandwidth, whether the cloud is like a public cloud or a private cloud. The same workflow, the workflow remains the same, but you get like much more powerful hardware and much more scalability, all within like the confines of the same interface. So, I'm going to go ahead and like start. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and like start a a benchmark here, um, and the benchmark is very simple. All that the benchmark is doing is like it's going ahead and like trying to run a ResNet uh, training model. Uh, if you're not familiar with ResNet, that's, you can just totally forget about it. Uh, <laughs> just consider it to be like an image, uh, image model where uh, it can predict what's in an image. Um, and, and here I'm training with like synthetic data, like pulling data from the cloud in a demo environment is again like pretty boring. So uh, the synthetic data here, this is all like part of the, the standard TensorFlow benchmarks. And what's happening here is like uh, behind the scenes, uh, it's, it, has, it has generated some, uh, some synthetic data and is starting to train. And you can see here that like, the training rate is like, literally 0.5 images per second. So it's pretty slow because I got like, a laptop, which is not even like, connected to power. So uh, all sorts of like, awesome things are happening behind the scenes to keep the demo going. So uh, the training rate is like, pretty low here. So this is not much fun, right? But there is value here because if you want to just like iterate on your model and like just play with the very basic architecture, you don't have to be in the cloud. You can be in your airplane or you can be at the comforts of your home and your couch and you can still like do your work. And when you get back to work the next day, which is what I'm going to show now, uh, or which is what I'm going to show next, you can let's say you're, you, let's say you have a Kubernetes cluster already running in some cloud. In this case, I'm conveniently using Google Cloud because that's the thing that I'm familiar with and it's pretty awesome. Um, so. Uh, here we go. So I have, a, I have a cluster already set up in Google Cloud, and I have like GPUs provisioned as part of this cluster. Um, and I'm going to use the same kube control workflow, right, just to prove that like, it's, it's pretty portable. Um, and I have these five nodes which have GPUs uh, in a GKE cluster. Um, and like, drivers and everything are pre-installed, right? Like, you, don't, you don't have to like, worry about that. So I'm going to do the same kube control apply here. Right? I, I'm, I'm literally in the same directory on my laptop, and I did kube control apply. Um, the next step is like I'm going to go to my uh, I'm going to go list the services here, and I have the same TensorFlow uh, uh, Jupyter Hub load balancer. Um, and as you can see here, the external IP hasn't been allocated yet, so we got to like wait for the, the external IP to be allocated. Uh, while that happens, I'm also going to explain to you uh, about the operator, um, which is the other part of of this, right? Like Jupyter gives you this interactive workflow where uh, you can train interactively, you can pull down data, you can like, do some data manipulation. But that's not great when you want to take it to production. Right? Like, when you want to take it to production, you want like, auditing, you want to like, checkpoint your workflows, you want to, know, you want to make it reproducible, uh, and you probably want to have like, some CI, CD pipelines, especially if you want to do like, ETL or batch, or like, online training, and, and all those kinds of like, interesting scenarios. Right? Um, and you can use Kubernetes for that as well. Um, and, and there's an interesting project for this, which is part of TensorFlow. Uh, it's, coincidentally, it's named TensorFlow slash Kates. Um, and what it does is like, it's basically an operator, if you're familiar with the Coros operator terminology. Um, and what this operator does is like, it gives you a, a Kubernetes style declarative API where uh, you can go ahead and like, express what sort of training you want to do, right? Like, whether it's like, training on your laptop with a single CPU or whether it's like, training in the cloud with like, many, many GPUs, it's the same declarative interface. All you do is like, make sure that your TensorFlow runtime is available within a Docker image, and we have some sample Docker images for that. And then you bring in your own like, TensorFlow code, like the code that you've written on Jupyter. Just transfer it, uh, like, maybe like, load, it, uh, load it onto like, say, your object store and pull it down or make it part of your container. And then you, you use this declarative API to go ahead and like, tell Kubernetes, tell this operator that like, go ahead and like, start TensorFlow training, right? Like, and like, tra do the training, and then go ahead and like, push the model somewhere else. And that's all like, automated for you, and you also get like, TensorBoard integrated with that. So I'm going to go ahead and like, deploy uh, one of those models as well. I'm not sure whether you guys are able to see this, 
Uh, it's probably pretty hard to read during the demo. I'm going to run through this, but like, please go ahead and like take a look look at this after the demo. Uh, the thing that I want to highlight here is like I'm going to deploy a distributed TensorFlow, which is considered to be kind of hard, and that's one of the reasons like people keep playing with like larger and larger boxes. So uh, here you have like distributed TensorFlow where uh, you're configuring a master which does not have GPUs, and then you're configuring three workers which has GPUs, um, and then you have a parameter server, right? And you're expressing all of this in a with a declarative API. Um, and I'm running the same benchmark, right? The one that I ran on the laptop, I'm, I'm going to run the same benchmark. And I'm also like go, going to go ahead and like deploy this in my GK cluster. Um, let's see. Um, kubectl apply dash f. I'm going to go ahead and do this. So I'm, I'm going to move back to my um, work cluster here. I'm going to go look at the workloads view. And what we see here is like we see uh, we see a bunch of pods being created, right? So I, I went ahead and like, I went ahead and like, applied a manifest, and that manifest ended up creating, um, that manifest ended up creating a custom uh, operator specification, um, and and this object, and the controller watching this object went ahead and created, uh, created the the TensorFlow entities that was expressed through the declarative API. So you have a master running here, you have a parameter server, and you have a bunch of workers running here, right? And and these workers are going to take some time in that, like they're going to take that input, they're going to go and like warm themselves up, like initialize TensorFlow, and then start training. But until then, like let's switch back to um, let's switch back to our original. Uh, yeah, here we go. So let's switch back to the Jupiter uh, side where we're doing interactive training. And now let's say that. Uh, I have come back to work. I did something at home. I've done some training. Now I want to like actually take it to the next level where like I want to continue doing some interactive training, but I want to like start processing a lot more data. And at this point, I need more memory. I need more CPUs. And I need more GPUs, right? So at this stage, um, okay. So here we go. So I'm right now. I'm in cloud. I went through the same process of like setting up Jupyter, but like Jupyter caches my identity, so it put me in a notebook because the notebook already exists. Right, I'm going to go ahead and like run the exact same benchmark, but this time I'm going to run it with GPUs. So I've changed the, I've changed the command line, the, the benchmark command line here a little bit to, to make it work with uh, GPUs. Uh, it's mostly about removing a bunch of other options that made it work with CPUs. But the point that I want, to, want you to take here is that uh, you can see, like in, in just a second, you'll see that the, the training rate is like so much faster, right? Like, this is not something Kubernetes is doing. It's like it's just the power of like GPUs and the optimization between TensorFlow and GPUs. But the point to take away here is that like your stuff is portable, right? Like everything is portable. Your workflow is portable. Everything remains the same. And now here you go. You move from like 0.5 images to like 200 plus images. And when you move to the distributed setting, uh, which which uh, we are seeing with the, with the operator, uh, your uh, your productivity level improves even further. Let's see if the if the distributed job actually completed. If not, we'll probably have to wait for that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and drill into the pods view, and I'm going to look at the logs for the pod. Um, OK, so the command did run successfully, um, and it's spamming me that it ran successfully. But the training rate here is like 240 images per second. right? So, so you can start scaling linearly, and you don't have to worry about like Numa and like whether I'm on the same PCI socket. Like Screw all that. You don't have to know all that. <laughs> like, just assume that you have some finite, amount, some 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 usable amount of network bandwidth. Then just keep scaling, like improve your developer productivity, right? And so this is not the only part. The other part that we want to show is like, let's say the whole point of this demo was like, I want to know if it's a hot dog or not, right? For folks who know what hot dog or not means, <laughs> let's say that I'm being very naive, where like I haven't, I don't know any machine learning, right? Like all I do is like I go ahead, I try to find, I try to find a picture. In this case, it's clearly not a hot dog, but I build a stupid system which just looks at the name of the file and it says whether it's hot dog or not. Right? <laughs> like, clearly, that's not a great system. Uh, no, we want to make it smarter. Um, and so let's say let's apply some machine learning. Right? In this case, I'm using like pre-existing models that have been trained for, uh, for doing this kind of task. Uh, and if you're curious, it's like the, it's an inception model. So I'm going to do the same thing. Right? Like, I'm going to go ahead and like deploy. Uh, I'm going to ask it, like, is this a hot dog with a real hot dog image? And uh, let's see what it says. Uh, is it going to the same thing? 
Maybe the services are still coming up, or is this a demo fail? Most likely a demo fail. Um, do I have time to do live debugging? Uh, no, I think we're all. <laughs> <laughs> like I guess I have two more minutes, so let's see. Uh, so let me show what's happening behind the scenes while uh, the demo may come up. So there's a model service here, right? Like the model service, what's, uh, what's going on at the model service, like it's TensorFlow serving, um, and it's pre-set up for you where with a model server, uh, you can configure it to, to make it point at like uh, your own model. In this case, like for the demo, we're making it point at a model that is hosted on GCS for us. So it's, it's being pointed at uh, a model that's, that's stored in a GCS bucket. But imagine that like, you have serving available and then you have your, your, your Jupyter workflow available. You built a model, right? And the model is like, stored on some, ob some object store that's shared storage or like your local laptop. All you have to do is like, go ahead and like, change this deployment and say, OK, I'm changing the command line arguments of that and making it point at my new model. And then you got serving going. Right? You don't have to think about that. You just have to do that one small thing. Um, and that said, let's see if let's see if we can give this another try, just one more time, David. <laughs> this, this did work. Um, let's see if the smart server is actually responds. So it's saying hey. like, it's a, it's a hot dog, right? Like we all know it's hot dog, but it's saying that. Uh, wait, I might be tricking you. Let's see if I'm tricking you, right? Like. What if I what if I throw at it something that's not a hot dog and it says it's not a hot dog? <laughs> right? So the thing is, you can do awesome things without having to like reinvent the wheels and without having to like know everything from scratch. Um, so you want to go back? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we are incredibly out of time, but I will be very quick. So oh shoot. So we are incredibly out of time. So uh, that's it. You, you took something and you deployed it in three places. But, but to be honest, the, the message here is um, if you're a data scientist, you didn't have to think about any of that. You didn't have to think about Kubernetes or learn it. You didn't have to do any special deployments. We took care of it for you. We expanded it for you. You began to really decouple the infrastructure from what the data scientists actually do. Uh, and so the answer is yes uh, for now. Uh, we are just getting started. We would love for you all to come and help contribute. We have an open source repo, um, uh, GitHub, WAC, uh, Google, WAC, uh, Kubeflow, thank you. Um, we, we really are just getting started. We want this to be a community where we come together. We know that almost everyone here, anyone doing ML, has written some custom bespoke solution for their team. We would love to help replace that so you can focus on the hard stuff um, and, and you can throw away the custom stuff yeah. you've written or augment it and upstream it or whatever it works. Yeah. Um, like so at, at minimum, just share your experience. Yeah. Right? Like or just tell share. us what you do every day, what works and what doesn't work. That is very valuable. So that's it. Thank you so much for the time. <laughs> oh, I guess, well, sorry, we do have two, two minutes for Q&A if you want. Yeah, it. we have like five more minutes, I guess. No, so. no, no, I thought we only had two. We, we two. Have Oh, well, we'll hang around here, but, yeah. and we technically have three minutes for Q&A, if you want. <laughs> Tell them when the next um, salon is. The next one's at uh, 2.45. Oh, oh. The ML, didn't you get a space for an ML salon? Oh, uh, I, I, yes, I don't know where it is. I'm sorry. What, what time did you get? What time is it? Uh, I think 5.45. Uh, was, was it 4.30 or 5.45? 4.30? I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. The spot. <laughs> Look at the schedule. There's an ML salon. And you're running that. Yes. How would you set up the node to be GPU capable? Uh, is this so on on a, on a laptop? Like maybe let's ignore the laptop. On a workstation, there's one part pending, which is enabling installation of drivers with device plugins. We're working on that, so we'll pro we're working with upstream community essentially on that. So that part is pending. But if you move to any cloud providers or like any managed Kubernetes, it's already there. Like you don't have to you don't have to think about it. Right. So. We're working, send, we're working send us a note if you're having problems with it. We'll, we'll find you the right person. In the future. Uh, yes. Very soon. The idea here, here, and again, we want to be cloud neutral here. The question was, uh, will we support TPUs, which is, uh, for those that don't know, uh, that's Gus, uh, Google's custom TP, uh, ML chip. Um, 
as, as you know, many clouds are investing in various custom ML chips. We want to, we want to create a real abstraction between this and, and whatever cloud provider would like to participate in Kubeflow and help us surface those custom chips, we are more than happy to include it. Yeah, it's like TPU is like 5% of all of this, right? And that like you're just changing one line of code literally for TPUs. Exactly. Everything else is the same. So everything else is like generic. Nice Pied Piper shirt there for... Um, <laughs> Any, any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much. We're, we'll wait around and we'll be outside. Thank you, everyone.